Hi everybody, Arsalan Arif here with Endpoints News and thanks for joining us. Did you know Australia has toxicology? That's our expert panel today and we're sponsored by Agilex Biolabs. I'm excited to moderate today's expert panel and today joining us we have Peter Tapley, Director of Toxicology at Agilex Biolabs. Also joining us today is Alfred Botchway, CEO and Chief Relationship Officer of Attentive Science, as well as Paul Wabnitz, HREC reviewer at Clin Pharma. If you have any questions during today's webinar, our panelists have reserved some time for questions at the end. Just hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen as soon as you think of the question. This webinar will be available on demand tomorrow to rewatch or to share with your colleagues. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Peter to get us started. Peter? Thank you, Hassan, and good morning to all our uh, listeners. Yeah, so uh, I'm Director of Toxicology at Agilex Biolabs. Uh, very brief background. Um, I did a, um, a Bachelor of Science in uh, Biology and a PhD in Biochemistry and Cancer Biology at uh, Flinders University in South Australia, in Australia, quite a few years back. Uh, subsequent to that, I uh, did postdoctoral research at Fred Hutchins Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington, and also at Bristol Myers Squibb, Princeton, New Jersey, in the uh, signal transduction uh, cell, cell biology area. And since 1994, I've worked in the uh, biotechnology pharmaceutical industry, initially in the US, uh, working at Ligand Pharmaceuticals in San Diego, and also GlaxoSmithKline in uh, Pennsylvania. And that work was uh, in uh, drug discovery development, uh, initially in, more in the drug discovery and subsequently also development area. In 2006, I moved back to Australia and uh, took a role at RDDT, a, a rodent uh, toxicology facility in Melbourne, Australia, acting as the uh, lead study director and leading the uh, toxicology work there. In 2013, I uh, moved to Brisbane, Australia, and uh, took on a role as a lead, leading the uh, toxicology, GLP rodent toxicology facility at uh, TetraQ, uh, which was subsequently um, became part of Agilex Biolabs in early 2021. And I continue in that role leading a GLP toxicology at Agilex Biolabs. Now I'll hand over to Dr. Alfred Botchway to, uh, from Attentive Science. Thank you, Peter. Very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on which part of the world you're joining us from. My name is Alfred Botchway, and I'm the Chief Executive and Chief Relationship Officer at Attentive Science. My educational background includes a bachelor's and a master's degree in biomedical science from Kingston University in Surrey, United Kingdom, as well as a PhD in cardiovascular electrophysiology from Imperial College London. I'm also a diplomat of the International Safety Pharmacology Society and served as the society's president in 2015. Subsequent to my academic tenure, I moved to Denmark to work for one of Denmark's largest pharmaceutical companies called Dunbeck. After about three and a half years, I relocated to the US to work for Quintons, which at the time had a non-clinical site in Kansas City, US. After Quintons sold the US operations and eventually that research site in Kansas City was closed, I had the opportunity to start a non-clinical contract research organization called Xenometrics here in Kansas City. I operated the Xenometrics facility and operations for about 12 years, and then had to exit as a result of an acquisition. In the subsequent year, I was the board chair and interim CEO of Biochemists, which is the trade organization for the bioscience companies in the state of Kansas. As previously mentioned, I'm now the CEO and CRO at Center of Science, and thank you for the invitation to this webinar. Paul. Thanks, Alf. <clears throat> I've got a background in drug development that started with a PhD in organic chemistry. I worked on uh, mass spectrometry in proteins and peptides um, 
deriving them mainly from uh, frog skin secretions and uh, also did a little bit with cancer research, which sparked my interest in oncology. Uh, at that time, I was fortunate to be able to publish a uh, first author nature publication, which allowed me to then have an industrial postdoctorate at Park Davis in Ann Arbor, Michigan in the beginning of 2000. Uh, not long after I started Park Davis bought I was bought by Pfizer and I was offered a um, preclinical position in drug metabolism and toxicology. And I um, worked at Pfizer for six years uh, and spent most of my time in preclinical development. Uh, and then towards the end of my time there in early phase uh, clinical trials, mainly in the areas of oncology and immunology. Uh, my time also was um, spent training in regulatory affairs. Uh, at Temple University in Philadelphia. And I also, through Pfizer's leadership program, obtained uh, an MBA from uh, what's now known as the Stephen Ross School of Business, but it was the University of Michigan Business School back then. Uh, and then for family reasons, I and also because I was homesick, I went back to Adelaide, Australia, and completed my medical degree uh, and went through specialization training. And uh, I'm a physician consultant uh, in clinical pharmacology. I also um, am a toxicologist and a principal investigator on a number of first in human trials and also a medical monitor in first in human trials, predominantly in medical oncology, which is my main area of interest. Um, I also am a primary HREC reviewer for the public and private sector, public meaning uh, the, the tertiary hospitals often have their own HREC departments. Uh, as a lot of the complicated trials are being done in tertiary hospital settings. I uh, also do some consulting uh, for first in human trials uh, as my main area of interest. So I'm just going to go straight into my talk. So streamlined regulatory approvals in Australia, what does that actually mean? We know that with drug development, uh, it's a quite a complex process where we rely on in our current development process on lab data and also in animal data in determining whether or not we can predict the safety of a new drug that's never been tested in humans before. When that drug transitions from preclinical, meaning before it's tested in humans, it needs to be approved by a regulatory authority. So in Australia, the best way to understand the way that the streamlined regulatory pathway works is to compare it to the very much established and very well um, you know, very highly reputable process in the US, which is conducted by the FDA. So the equivalent of this process in Australia is really lies under the TGA, which stands for the Therapeutic Goods Administration. But the main difference between the US and Australia is rather than the TGA being responsible for the reviews and the approvals, they delegate that through a clinical trial notification process, which I've, I've got labeled there as a CTN, uh, to the HREC, which stands for the Human Research Ethics Committee. That Human Research Ethics Committee consists of anywhere between seven to 15 individuals. And it's a mixture of scientific and non-scientific, medical and non-medical individuals. But within that committee, there's one primary reviewer and one secondary reviewer. It's those reviewers that have significant experience in drug development. And a lot of those reviewers have had experience working in the US and have a significant experience with preparing INDs uh, under the FDA US process. So the difference also lies with the way that uh, the approval is conducted. So the equivalent would be uh, IND process in the US. Here we call it a CTN, which stands for clinical, clinical trial notification or CTA. I'll go through that in a bit more detail in a short while. Uh, a big difference between the two processes are we know that IND can be quite intense. Uh, compared to the CTN, it is a very low resource burden. There's essential documents that are required still. So the protocol is obviously the, the map for how the clinical trial is being conducted. The investigative brochure is essentially where all the preclinical and safety data is contained. And then informed consent. So the FDA process is very well established. It has a high safety and quality standards and uh, the approval process essentially revolves around the FDA guidelines. We still have that same high safety quality standard in Australia, 
um, we don't have any mandated guidelines. So our process is really closely aligned between the FDA, but also incorporates some of the EMA and the international um, ICH guidelines. So the two pathways for submission uh, include the clinical trials notification, the CTM process, or the CTA process. The approval can go through a single committee or it can be submitted to a human research ethics application where it can go to a single site that then covers multiple sites. What that does is it gives an advantage of having one approval that covers multiple sites and it, it, it prevents duplication. Uh, this, is, this process is, uh, I guess it, it works under this uh, nation, national mutual acceptance uh, scheme. So you, you may hear that being mentioned, the NMA, but that's essentially what that is. So if you're looking at the CTN and CTA process, more, the majority of the submissions are CTNs uh, with less than 10% of submissions being CTAs. CTN is really just a simple uh, process with the documentations that I've discussed. What the CTA process has is more of the high risk uh, applications where there's limited understanding of the safety profile and the risks of the drug. The choice, often we get asked, what's the choice between a CTN and a CTA? Well, really the first uh, decision lies with the sponsor to determine that. The second decision lies with the ethics committee that's approving the application. And that really depends on the expertise level of that committee. And the main criteria and difference between what determines a CTN or a CTA is whether or not uh, that molecule is a biological class four, that automatically will then make it a CTA. So class four biologicals essentially are molecules that have some inherent change to the cell biology, that have an introduced function to their, such as cell therapy. Uh, they also include live cells, tissues, and organs. I'll just outline the process because this is often a, a question that we get asked. So what is the, what is the approval process uh, that this streamlined uh, advantage in Australia uh, relies on. So it's essentially an official pro efficient process where there's regular HREP me meetings, both in the public and private sectors. Uh, and again, these are experienced reviewers that conduct the majority of the review. The primary and secondary reviewers are often have other jobs. So they're doing this above and beyond their normal job, uh, which relies on um, a lot of um, I guess intense work is when the reviews um, can be quite intensive. And so um, I guess the, the committee um, is then shared uh, within a number of com uh, committee reviewers as well. So the regulatory submission uh, essentially starts with a submission of the essential documents. And so this occurs two weeks prior to the HREC meeting. The HREC meeting itself would then occur two weeks after those documents are submitted, and that is where the scientific and ethical review is conducted. What that generates then is the primary and secondary reviewers will present all their findings, uh, and then that will generate a list of questions that are predominantly constructed by the primary reviewers, but also the, the rest of the committee and by the HREC chair. Those questions are then posted back to the sponsor and to the, to the organization that submitted the ethics submission. Uh, and that usually takes three to four days post the actual meeting itself. Regulatory approval then can occur not long after, three to four days after the cycle one responses are obtained back by the HREC committee. Usually what happens then is the primary and secondary reviewer and the chair will have a look at those cycle responses and sometimes the entire committee will as well. Uh, if that is approved, then the CTN will be lodged to the TDA, and that's more of an administrative process that can take up to 10 days. But essentially what this means is that from beginning to end, it can take six to eight weeks if the submission's robust. This means that within six to eight weeks, the site initiation meeting can commence, screening and enrollment can commence, and the first subject is dosed. And this is a significant advantage and sort of summarizes the streamlined approach. 
what next? If you don't mind, um, may I ask you a quick question? You mentioned six to eight weeks post submission. Is that the typical time frame for approval for clinical trials? It is if it's a good submission. So if the submission is well done, and what I mean by well done, that uh, the appropriate preclinical development uh, material has been done according uh, to standards, but also covers all the questions. I guess with, with predefined pathways, such as small molecules and biologicals, we know that they follow very much uh, a driven process from guidelines, but there's also the novel uh, drugs, which sometimes fall outside of those guidelines. But with those submissions, and they're the most interesting ones, uh, we still need to know that it's safe and that the correct toxicology has been done based on the pharmacology of that molecule. So if that's all been prepared and um, submitted, then a cycle response should generate just minimal questions rather than significant questions asking for repeat toxicology. And that's the, I guess that's the key key part to this is that uh, planning your preclinical development plan is essential in order for this to work as a streamlined process. If there's missing parts, then that streamlined process is no longer streamlined because sponsors will need to go back and repeat studies or add studies or uh, address significant questions. Thank you. Another way of looking at this is the looking at the traditional approach for an IND submission. So when we look at INDs, we have the pre-IND meeting and the IND submission, uh, and then that goes to the, to the first in human phase one clinical trial approval. The Australian advantage can be summarized like this, that it begins with the phase one trial. That data can then be used for a pre-IND meeting that then leads towards the IND submission. And I often tell sponsors this, rather than going to the FDA pre-IND meeting asking questions, especially for complex drug development programs, why not come to the pre-IND meeting with some positional statement saying, look, this is what we have shown, this is what we plan to do. And uh, it really just then strengthens that position for the IND submission. And I think that really is one of the advantages of what we do here in Australia is that we still produce a very solid, robust preclinical and clinical package that then is very well received um, by the US FDA. At least that's been my experience. So a common question that we get, I often get is uh, in Australia, do you need to do toxicology and does it need to be GLP? <clears throat> well, the simple answer to that is yes. Uh, you do need tox and it has to be done under good laboratory practices. Um, so the key thing here is, as I mentioned before, the similarities and the differences still lie with the fact that both the FDA and what we do here in Australia through the TGA and the ethics, the h uh, submissions, we rely on high safety and quality standards. And, and that makes sense, right? Because the drug hasn't been tested in humans before. So we have to make sure that the same high quality standards apply uh, to any situation. And so that requires a very robust uh, toxicological package to be conducted. So the strain advantage, even though it's fast, efficient, streamlined, does not mean that certain safety studies need to be skipped. However, in certain situations, uh, there are um, exceptions to that, and that's a, a probably outside the scope of this talk, but there are certain examples that we can give where uh, the entire process does not need to be conducted, but that really is dependent on the mechanism of the drug and also the pharmacology of that drug. Sorry, Dr. Watkins, that's me again, uh, to ask you this question. Can we assume that the GMP, GLP that I've seen pop up on your slides have the same meaning globally, especially um, between the US and, and Australia? Can you tell us a little bit more? It's a good question, actually. Um, so GLP and GMP, the whole advantage of uh, those acronyms, all they mean is a good practice, is that they ensure conformance across every country that uh, utilizes those processes. So that's the advantage of using those systems is that they are the same in every country that applies those processes. They are a standardized process to ensure quality and safety. Thank you. So GLP uh, is the non-clinical component and 
the, the best way to think of what's required in terms of GLP preclinical development is all the pivotal safety. What that means, it's the safety that determines whether or not that drug will be safe in humans. Uh, and that includes the safety pharmacology, the, the toxicology, which includes pharmacokinetics, toxicokinetics, and depending on the study, often bridging safety studies if there's precedence involved. GCP then is the, the, the standards that are conducted with the clinical trial. And then GMP is the other standards, that stands for good manufacturing practice for the manufacturing. And really all that means is that the manufacturing process has to ensure that, especially with biologicals, that there's no batch to batch variation, that we know that that drug has the same consistency and potency uh, and that it's been engineered in the correct way. With, with GMP, I just will make a quick mention of, uh, we often get also asked about GMP, uh, whether or not GMP is required for um, preclinical development. Uh, and if it's GMP light, the reality is it's, it's either GMP or it's not GMP. Uh, good manufacturing practices are required for using a drug in human clinical studies. I think where the confusion often lies is in an engineering batch. All that means is it undergoes GMP process, but the final product may not be completely purified. So it may contain some impurities uh, and that's acceptable because we know that the toxicology studies are then conducted with impurities present. So if anything, that's providing a much broader coverage of safety, um, but once it's purified, they don't need to be repeated. That's very different to having a drug that's reformulated. That can, depending on the reformulation, that can produce a new chemical entity and that would require a, a relook at the toxicology and a repeat of the toxicology in a lot of circumstances. So I just finished on this slide, um, some complexities and common traps. And I believe that we might discuss this at another presentation in a little bit more detail because we can go through quite a number of you know, common reoccurring uh, traps with submissions. Um, but if we start with small molecules, like small molecules are very standard. We, you know, broke, they've been around for a very long time. Aspirin is a great example of a small molecule. That drug development process involves a rodent and a non-rodent species to be required for toxicology. Uh, the non-rodent is often driven by the preclinical metabolism. And that's what determines the choice of species, not anything else. With small molecules, the maximum recommended starting dose is based on the NOEL, that stands for No Observed Adverse Effect Level. Uh, and this really determines then the safety window. That's the toxicological window. So traps common in this particular range of drug development programs are with reformulations and with prodrugs. In this situation, not always does the toxicology need to be repeated uh, if there's precedence. So in this situation, an example of a bridging study would be with a prodrug to, to show that that prodrug's conversion is 100% uh, to, its, to its drug. Uh, and if that's the case, then that information from precedence can be applied, but that would then require a whole lot of uh, metabolic studies to show that that conversion is occurring, for example, with oral uh, administration in the in the stomach prior to systemic uh, absorption. Large molecules, so biologicals, monoclonal antibodies. In this situation, the maximum recommended starting dose is based on the minimum anticipated biological effect level. So it's complete opposite to small molecules. And what this means is the safety is then determined rather than on the toxicity, is determined on the pharmacology. And the reason being is with Monoclonal antibodies are a great example where they're not really that toxic, but what they do do is with their efficacy, like their known effect, uh, they can cause toxicity just from what they're meant to be doing. So a good example of that is immunotherapy. We know that immunotherapy can cause harmful effects when it overstimulates the immune system. So a lot of traps in this area really rely on the starting dose calculations on the MABEL. Uh, and this is where a lot of questions and a lot of um, uh, missteps sometimes occur with submissions. And that relies on good potency data, good dose response data, determining the IC50, the EC50, uh, doing a cytokine release assay, if it's an immunotherapy-based large molecule, and then determining the pharma pharmacological active dose based on the plasma volume, uh, that they would, would calculate the human equivalent doses. And this, these are often areas that some of the submissions uh, stumble with. And then there's a list of others that I won't go into a lot of detail, 
uh, as I've mentioned, we may cover this in another talk, this comes up, but I'll just use a very brief example with peptides. Peptides are an interesting one because they don't quite fall under small or large, they're somewhere in the middle. And the, the best way to think of peptides uh, is to determine where they fit based on the way they're manufactured. If the peptides manufactured through recombinant, pro, a recombinant manner, or if it's a biological extract, then that goes under the large molecule pathway. If that peptide is synthesized, then that goes under the small molecule pathway. So it's not necessarily determined based on size, but by its GMP process. The other traps for other interesting drug programs, uh, multifunctional agents, radio label therapies, where you have to not just look at the safety of the actual drug or the conjugate that the radioisotopes binding to, but the affinity, the off-target toxicity is a common trap where the radioisotope in oncology, for example, may be against a tumor, but the isotope may also bind to a systemic organ. And so that's where toxicology plays a very important role and the preclinical development design is essential for a robust submission in order to make it streamlined. Ingenuid cells, such as CAR T cells, are another great example. These days, there's other types of engineering. There's uh, engineered cells against certain viruses. So we've come a long way with engineering. But again, that also requires significant complex toxicological thinking and strategic planning. Immunomodulators uh, have the risk of large uncontrolled amplification, and we can screen risks for that with in vitro and in vivo testing. Gene therapy and Oncolytic viruses are another example, and then devices also have their own specific inherent traps. Dr. Peter Tuckley, the rest of the world needs to know a bit more about rebates, benefits of doing toxicology in Australia. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, thank you, Alf. Uh, I can certainly talk to that, and I believe I have a slide which will address that. So the 43.5% cash rebate for R&D expenses occurred in Australia. I think there's quite a bit of awareness now in the US and other jurisdictions of the availability of that. Uh, this is a companies with a turnover of less than 20 million can receive a, a cash refund for eligible expenses. Um, one important point that I really want to stress today is that uh, typically the cash rebate has been accessed for a lot of clinical development in Australia but that cash rebate is equally applicable to non-clinical. And so toxicology expenses occurred, uh, incurred within Australia for clinical development are eligible for that cash rebate. And that's really the point I want to make. Also, um, there's something called an overseas finding which allows an offshore study to be eligible for a cash rebate if that service is not available in Australia. And that can be applicable, for example, to some of the second species studies that uh, Attentive Science can run in collaboration with Agile X Biolabs, which we don't have the capability for in Australia. So really, there's the opportunity to take advantage of that cash rebate for a full IND enabling um, top GLP toxicology program. As, and what we'll talk about today is how Agile X and Attentive can provide uh, the collaboration between those two entities can provide access to that scheme. And I'd finish the uh, discussion of tax uh, matters by saying that I'm clearly not a uh, tax expert and formal R&D tax consultant advice is always recommended. And our BD people uh, can provide uh, contacts, introductions to some uh, good Australian R&D tax uh, consultants. Excuse me, Peter, can I ask a question? Yes, certainly. So with your slide, so that's a, another common question, uh, at least I often get asked uh, about toxicology studies. So with the rebate, a lot of uh, mis misunderstanding relies on the fact that if, I think most people think that the, in order to get their rebate, the toxicology studies have to be done in Australia. But what you're saying that toxicological studies that are done overseas potentially can also be eligible for that rebate. Is that correct? Yes, if you can make an argument that that, service is not available in Australia, and for example, there's some second species which are not available in Australia, then uh, you can obtain an overseas, potentially obtain an overseas finding to make that uh, expense incurred eligible for the uh, R&D tax credit. Yeah, that's great, that's, that's very helpful. Thanks, Peter. So switching back to um, uh, toxicology. Um, I want to give you a quick introduction to Agilex Biolab, um, Biolab's toxicology services. 
So we're a client focused provider of high quality rodent toxicology services to support uh, drug development up to first in human studies. Uh, the range of services we offer includes exploratory tox and uh, pharmacokinetic studies up to uh, GLP toxicology studies in rodents to enable first in human from 28 days and longer. In addition, we have support uh, for in-house support for our uh, uh, biomedical services, both uh, for small molecules and large molecules. So why would Australia be a ju jurisdiction of choice for non-clinical toxicology to support clinical development? Uh, I've already talked about one driver is the uh, R&D tax rebate, so we can provide access to that R&D tax rebate, so we can provide a significant uh, cost savings to run studies here. But in addition to that, uh, we need some other key uh, components to make it a, a good choice. And one is quality, uh, speed, and experience. And the next few slides will address that, and I'll talk about how we stack up in these areas and why we're a, a good choice for the, your non-clinical development. So in terms of quality, um, so our facility is good laboratory practice compliant. We operate to OECD GLP, uh, which is our primary air quality standard. Um, Agilex has an FDA inspection history also dating back from 2011. And our bioanalytical lab also has uh, ISO 1725 accreditation, uh, which and both our OECD GLP and ISO uh, standards are monitored by uh, the National Association of Testing Authorities, which is the Australian Government GLP Compliance Monitoring Authority. And compliance monitoring by NATA is conducted on a biannual uh, schedule. So every two years, I'll inspect our site and inspect various studies and uh, review those studies for GLP compliance. And for example, in December 21, uh, just a couple of months back, we had a on-site inspection over a week uh, by NATA, where they went through a number of studies and they provided some findings, which we've been able to address in the uh, in January, and we're now just waiting on confirmation of uh, continuation of our uh, GLP recognition for another two years. OECD GLP is uh, regulated differently to FDA GLP, but it's an equivalent standard, and GLP studies are acceptable for submission to Australian. US and European regulatory authorities. So an OECD GLP study supporting first in human in Australia will be part of a package which could then go to the US for a uh, IND submission. In addition, we always welcome sponsor audits. So uh, both um, international and local uh, clients are very welcome to visit either in person or do a remote audit. At the moment, there's been a lot of remote audits, but we're looking forward to having clients on site soon for sponsor audits. And our, our quality system is driven by continuous improvement culture, so we're always looking for ways to improve. We just recently implemented a new uh, electronic quality management system upgrade, a new system altogether, which we've just rolled out. So we really can meet uh, international quality standards. Another important driver is experience and uh, we've operated uh, to GLP compliance from 2006 to the present. So we've got uh, a number of years of experience there in terms of our GLP, um, maintaining GLP compliance and conducting GLP studies. And the current team has over 80 years of relevant experience in conduct of rodent toxicology studies to GLP. So we really are an experienced general toxicology provider of both non-GLP and formal GLP studies in rodents. Uh, for example, during the uh, last couple of years of the pandemic, we we're uh, fortunate enough to conduct uh, four uh, GLP studies in rats and mice to support the clinical development of three novel uh, COVID-19 vaccine candidates uh, through the first in human studies in Australia. A second key driver for a selection of a toxicology facility is speed. An Agile X Biolabs and collaborator attended uh, sciences can provide quick start-up times for our toxicology studies. And in Australia, they're facilitated by a local regulatory processes and access to animal models. So in terms of institutional animal use and care approval processes, Agilex has access to a local uh, animal ethics committee for approval of our animal studies. Uh, and they have a rolling monthly schedule for uh, approval processes. So 
briefly, we will submit an application two weeks before the first Wednesday of each month. And that uh, study will be considered for approval on the first Wednesday, and we'll have an approval within two to three weeks uh, sub, uh, post that. So we've got about a six week turnaround time for approval of uh, animal use. And our animals are available on a um, weekly basis from our supplier in Australia, uh, both rats and mice. Uh, a ready supply there, so that's not limiting. So subject to availability of test item, we can get into animals within six to eight weeks from uh, signing the contract and having confirmation of our uh, test material supply. In addition to uh, the animal use approval process, another advantage we have is a streamlined regulatory approval process for scheduled drugs and GMOs. Uh, for example, uh, we have a local license to hold tightly regulated scheduled drugs, which include um, US Schedule 1 drugs such as cannabinoids and psychedelic drugs with high potential for abuse. In Australia, they're identified as uh, Schedule 9 drugs, slightly confusing, but uh, same, same class of drugs. Uh, we can add those to our license within two to three weeks from uh, a request uh, via a local approval process versus six months for a US DEA approval. And also, uh, we have the ability to uh, attain approval for use of genetically modified organisms uh, via a local biosafety committee within four to six weeks of a uh, application submission. So we can really get our study started up uh, uh, with good speed uh, and subject to uh, availability of the test material from our client. And last point I'd like to make regarding the uh, facility is our access to uh, our bioanalytical support via our um, Adelaide uh, based, uh, Adelaide Australian based uh, facility. They have 25 years experience in uh, regulated bioanalytical service provision, uh, and so they can provide full uh, top support for our toxicology studies, both for small molecules using LCMS-based methods and immunoassay methods for uh, uh, large molecules, and uh, also ADA, uh, PK for large molecules, plus uh, antibody titer assays for vaccine immune response. And that works all conducted to GLP compliance. And at this stage, I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Alfred Butchway from Initiative Science, who can talk about the further about the uh, collaboration between Agilex Biolabs and Attentive Science, and why that provides another level of uh, service to our um, to our clients. Alfred, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Irrespective of our time zone differences for our two companies. Over the next few minutes, I would like to share with you why the attentive collaboration with a specific focus on you, the beneficiary, um, the requirements for the collaboration and benefits to you. So if I may start with you, the sponsor. So for you, the sponsor, we appreciate very much that you have lots of options on where you could place your non-clinical safe work. There is that old adage in the service industry of clients having to pick between price, quality, and timelines. So with this agile, attentive collaboration between our companies, we believe you should not have to choose between price, quality, and timelines. Peter discussed with us earlier the huge financial benefit of conducting your toxicology work in Australia or having it done as an overseas finding, which goes a lot to you not needing to choose a site based on price. Secondly, both companies have demonstrated quality service to the industry and supported multiple sponsors alike. Last but not least, we certainly have the resources to provide you with quicker start timelines, which then enables you to stay on track with your internal regulatory path and timeline requirements. To really take advantage of this significant collaboration, what, what do we need from you? What are the requirements? The requirements are fairly simple. One, having an agreement with Agilex, 
and having your test substance or API ready for testing. Paul told us earlier about GMP, GMP Lite, GLP material. Um, it's really important before you come to us to know what you're presenting to us and have that material ready. So we'll not spend any more time on the different types of material. The only other requirement we will have for you, the sponsors, therefore, to contact your local business development representative. It really is my hope that over the past half hour or so, this panel has been able to share with you the benefits of the collaboration. And now, believe it or not, you know Australia does toxicology studies. The benefits can be pinpointed to the following. You as a sponsor can fulfill the global requirement of needing two species for standard toxicology testing as stated in multiple global guidelines such as the International Conference for Harmonization Guidelines, um, such as the ICH S6, M3, uh, S7A, SB, S4, and other points of documents to consider. Multiple test systems such as mice, rodents, guinea pigs, ferrets, hamsters, mini pigs, canines and larger test systems are available to you. So at this point, maybe I'll pause and ask, so Paul, if I was in this audience, I'd probably be wondering why Australia doesn't have larger test systems. Would you be able to enlighten us on that? <clears throat> yeah, it's a good question. So large species in Australia, definitely something that Australia is not, not um, not known for. And I think really, I guess my answer to that would be Australia's historically been very strong in early discovery uh, and in non-GLP work. So um, the commercialization aspect is something that historically Australia has lagged a little bit behind. Um, I guess in recent times with the GLP toxicology uh, increasing uh, in services as, as an example uh, during this presentation and what Peter's presented. So the GLP uh, area has increased significantly. It's obviously a lot uh, more intensive uh, setting up larger species. But I think really that's, that's been, that's my understanding is that in, essentially historically Australia has been very strong with early stage discovery, preclinical work, but GLP work um, besides Agilex and a, and a few other smaller facilities, it's not really something that Australia has historically done. Thank you. So continuing with the benefits to you, the sponsor, Agilex has made available a seamless contracting process, which means you don't have to deal with the two entities separately, which also means in addition to saving all the money that Peter talked about through rebates, you're also saving valuable time. We all know time can sometimes, and most times, equate to money. I strongly believe there is no better place to receive an agile attentive service than through this collaboration. We can certainly provide you a single point of contact as you see fit. With that said, Peter, you and I have worked on several programs jointly, and Maybe that's an example we can share and tell the audience how this came about. Thanks, Alf. Yes, um, happy to uh, jump in and uh, discuss a case study. Um, so in this instance, the client was a US-based biotechnology company developing a small uh, molecule intended for use in oncology. And they required a full IND enabling GLP TOC package to start uh, to support their first in human studies to be conducted in Australia. Um, they initially had contacted uh, Agilex Biolabs BD, uh, and from that we uh, initial contact, we provide an introduction to Attentive Science, and in collaboration with Attentive Science, we developed a, a program a proposal, and the, which was then accepted by the client, and they, um, uh, the, the program was contracted with Agilex Biolab directly with subcontract of dog studies and safety pharmacology back to Attentive. 
So that provided, as Alf's been talking about, uh, described, uh, it provided a, a single um, contract uh, for the client and the ability to run both their um, rodent studies in Australia and the dog studies in Safety Farm with Materium Sciences. And in addition, uh, Agile XY Labs was able to provide the biomedical support across both species for that study. Uh, there were weekly meetings with uh, Agile X Biolabs, Attentive Science and the client. So there was really um, collaborative uh, approach to the program between the two uh, CROs and uh, working with the client to make that a successful program. Do you want to comment further? Oh, back to you. I think you've described it perfectly and um, really just to amplify a little bit of what you said. Uh, this to us really brings to the table resources that our sponsors can take advantage of. At this point, I'll hand over back to our moderator to see if we have any further questions. Answer them. Indeed we do. We got some questions from the audience and I'm going to go ahead and start and pose it to y'all over here. So first of all, what licenses or import or export requirements are needed? for shipment of different classes of experimental test articles into Australia? For example, small molecules, biologicals, and GMOs? Thanks, Ashlyn, I can handle that one. Um, yeah, so th that varies depending on the class of compound. Um, as mentioned, uh, Agilex Biolabs has uh, local approvals to um, handle um, small molecules, so synthetic organic compounds, uh, regulated scheduled drugs, um, if it, a small molecule is a regulated drug, we would need to, pro, to obtain a uh, national approval from that, from uh, the uh, federal authority. Uh, that's actually quite a quick process. Uh, they work on a 30 working day turnaround time for those compounds. Other experimental novel small molecules, which are not regulated, uh, we can bring them in uh, directly uh, without uh, formal uh, regulatory approval, so there's no real issue with uh, bringing in small, most experimental small molecules, um, just with a commercial invoice essentially describing them. For um, biologics, we have a biological import permit, which covers most biologicals, so there uh, is really no issue with that. We just need to, again, provide a detailed commercial invoice describing the goods, so we can bring them in. And typically, we would always recommend using a uh, uh, medical courier such as Marken or a World Courier, those sort of uh, couriers, uh, transport companies who are working with medical uh, products and understand how to get them through. So, yeah, really, that's quite straightforward. GMOs, uh, we would need genetically modified organisms. Uh, we would need a um, local approval for that. and. Uh, and also a um, notification. So again, there's a fairly straightforward approval process in most instances for those, that type of uh, experimental uh, uh, therapy. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks for that. Our next question over here are, is, what are the average startup timelines for rodent and dog toxicology studies? So let me jump in first to talk about the rodent. Um, I guess the uh, qualification for uh, startup timelines is always that we need to have the uh, test material available. So we're always working with our sponsors to work out uh, their timelines for that. And that's really a critical, critical component for that. Um, but yeah, we can, from signing of a contract uh, and running through our local ethics approval process is about a six to eight week process. Uh, so we potentially can be starting uh, early stage studies, six to eight weeks um, post contract signing, uh, subject to test item availability. And I'll hand over to Alf to talk about uh, dogs. Thank you, Peter. The timelines for the non rodent species are very similar. And that's what makes this collaboration even more exciting. Um, on the US side, we have managed so far to be able to secure the larger test systems that are needed. Um, in the right time to be able to start those studies. There hasn't been any delays so far. I guess the other. I'm not going to mention NHPs. NHPs are something else. You will, no matter where you go, you're going to have to wait, but that's not what we're talking about here. 
Sorry, if I just jump in as well, just to, the other uh, factor affecting startup time is bioanalytical support as well. If we're looking at a small molecule, we need to work out sample collection conditions uh, in the R&D phase of the bioanalytical method workup to uh, make sure we can collect the sample uh, correctly in those early stage studies, but that's generally going to be not limiting for that. All right, very good. Alf, um, can I just, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, can please, I, can I just make a comment on um, what you said, Alf, because that's a very important point regarding uh, species selection for non-rodents. Um, you mentioned dogs and non-human primates. I think there's, again, uh, some misunderstanding with ro uh, non rodent species selections with some um, drug development programs where I think it's assumed that uh, the non-human primate is required because that's what other studies have had. It's really driven, especially with uh, non-biologicals, is really driven by metabolism and what we see in in vitro studies and how we predict the metabolic pathway as comparable to the human microsomes and hepatocytes and S9 fractions. So that that's really what drives that non-rodent species selection. So um, mentioning uh, the, the difficulty having a non-human primate is important. I think it's also uh, essential that sponsors and uh, in their program design it well in terms of selecting that species early on and not just assuming it's always going to be a non-human primate. So the biologicals, the non-human primate is often selected uh, because it closely resembles the human immunological uh, I guess process and function, but again, it's not always the case with all biologicals, and it really depends on the physiology and the mechanisms. So I think that's a very good point that you mentioned about the the non-human primates. There's a very much a shortage in that area, and they're um, really being quite um, rationale based in terms of just looking for ways to avoid using them, and that's really driven by a very thorough, well-designed preclinical design. Okay, very good. Um, so our last question over here, how do you manage the communication process considering the different time zones? That's, that's a good one. Um, fortunately, the time zones, although they're very different, seem to overlap well because the folks in Australia are early at work, which ends up being an early, so when I say early, early in the morning at work, equates to an early afternoon on the US side. So we're able to communicate effectively through various technologies that are available to us and hand over projects and status to one another. Yeah, I'm always, generally we've got a weekly uh, uh, teleconference or call with the uh, the client in both the Australian and US labs so we can catch up with everybody at the same time. And again, yeah, early morning after in Australia, afternoon in US. In Europe, then we have to switch it around. It's going to be the other way around. It's more challenging if you've got one in uh, a client with lab uh, offices in Europe and US in this, and we're talking from Australia. We can work around. All right. All right, everyone. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. I want to thank everyone in the audience for tuning in and thanks to our panel for sharing their time and expertise. I really appreciate it. Alfred Botchway, Paul Wapnitz, and Peter Tapley. I really appreciate Agilex Biolabs for sponsoring this discussion at Endpoints webinars as well. If you'd like to rewatch this panel or share it with your colleagues, a link for on-demand watching will be sent tomorrow. I'm Arslan Ara for Endpoints News. Thanks for joining us and we hope to see you at a future webinar event. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>